Stay up to date on the latest political news this election season for less. Visit inforum.news forward slash port and get three months of unlimited access to our news network for only 99 cents a month. Subscribe now at inforum.news forward slash port. Welcome to Plain Talk, and happy to be with you folks. You know, we, oh gosh, we've been talking a lot about term limits lately, but it's it's probably, I mean, what, what are the two measures on, on well, at least on the statewide ballot this um, coming up in, in November? The, the two issues are, uh, one is to legalize recreational marijuana, and of course we're going to have more on that on the show in, in the future, but the other one is, is term limits, and Boy, that's a big deal for our state. Um, I don't think it's a decision voters should be made casually. I know a lot of North Dakotans hear term limits and just immediately they they like the idea. But the problem is the consequences of of implementing term limits are are maybe not something folks are thinking of. For one thing, I think a lot of people think term limits, they think Congress. But these term limits aren't for Congress. They're for our state lawmakers. And our state lawmakers are already part-time. And, oh, hey, by the way, we're already turning them over at a pretty brisk pace. Anyway, it was interesting last week. Two of North Dakota's largest agriculture groups, I would say the, the two largest in our state, North Dakota Farmers Union and the North Dakota Farm Bureau, issued a, a joint press release, which if you follow North Dakota politics, that's a pretty unusual development that these two groups would come together. I think they share a lot of the same goals, often maybe disagree on how to get there. Um, they issued a joint press release and in that, you know, said, hey, listen, folks, don't do this. Don't don't pass. Don't pass term limits. And I'm going to read you part of the statement came from my guest, uh, North Dakota Farmers Union President Mark Watney. He said in the release, quote, we felt it important to voice together our concerns about this measure at Farmers Union. We have a long-standing policy that opposes term limits because they are a limitation on the rights of citizens to choose and elect their public officials. Term limits also put more power into the hands of professional lobbyists and career bureaucrats. Mark, first of all, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. And um, describe for me what, how your group arrived at this position. Well, you know, we have a, a pretty grassroots system, so we have a, a number of of members and elect delegates they come to our convention they put together these policies that we work on an annual basis and when we say it's a long-term standing it has been it's been in our policy for as long as i can remember and i've been involved for quite a few years so we come to these things when we look at what's the role of people in a democracy in a where you elect the electable republic if you want to call it that also is to take the time get educated and, and to vote the people in that they want to represent them into the future. It's not about uh, automatic systems that uh, take people out. It's about people participating. So we encourage that. We, we really think it's really important that people go out, they talk to the candidates, they talk to them, and then if they don't like somebody or don't think that person represents them, they vote against them. At the end of the day, the election's over, and we work with who gets elected. Um, you know, we're a political organization. We're not a partisan organization. And, and the reason for that is, is we get involved politically. We try to get the education components out so people can make up their mind. But when the election's done, we work with who gets elected. And if the citizens do this same thing, you don't need a term limit. You, your term limit is the election. So that's how the system works. You know, I, it, it was interesting. One of the um, Scott Tillman, he's the head of the uh, U.S. term limits. They're the national group that has been bankrolling, that has put a lot of money into this this local campaign he actually showed up on my facebook page um over the weekend and he was re responding to my my story about your the press release that your group and, and north Dakota farm bureau sent out and one of the things he was saying is he was dismissing you guys he was saying oh these are these are exactly you know the the sort of lobbyists and 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 political professionals that that they're talking about his argument is people like you are opposing term limits because you're lobbying the legislature, so you're getting in cozy with the, the the legislators, so you don't want you don't want them to be term limited out. Can you respond to that? I'm sure that's probably a criticism you heard a lot. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, actually flipping it the wrong way. The the reality is when you have a changeover, rapid changeover, without some historic value to the people that have been in the legislature for a period of time. Um, you tend to give more power to lobbyists. You tend to uh, let the bureaucracies kind of lead the discussion. 
Um, you need you need changeover, but you need sustainability of people with the knowledge and the background to educate and to help each one of those folks that are elected to come into the system and understand how our government works. So there, there's a balance here, but I really don't see it that way because the fact of the matter, I trust that the voting public is doing their job and they're out there electing people that represent them. That's why we focus so much on working with who gets elected rather than questioning why and all that, because at the end of the day, um, it's about getting things done. And, you know, people that do the public service, whether you're a Democrat, Republican or an independent, uh, you're taking on a big responsibility. And uh, I respect people that do that. And if they go through and they're able to convince enough people in our democracy to vote for them, then they deserve the right to work for the people. And uh, I think it's time that we find ways to influence them. We give them the information they need. And uh, of course, then they get to vote on things that are important to us and their record themselves will be what leads people down the path to support them in the future. So I, I don't spend a lot of time worried about uh, um, all the games played because there's lots of games played in politics. Uh, but the fact is uh, we're out there to try to influence I mean, as a lobbyist, but we're also respecting the folks that run and having that opportunity to run if the people so choose to elect. Do you feel like, because uh, I, I think you make a really good point, like like the argument is somehow um, term limits hurts lobbyists because the, the people that they're, they get cozy in the good old boys, club, all those yeah. stuff, all that stuff we hear. And listen, I'm not dismissing those sorts of concerns. Those sorts of concerns are valid. But I, I think the problem is, is people think, you know, it, it takes a lot of confidence. Like when you, when you go and you're one member of the legislature, you go there and it's, it's a big, big job. And there are so many facets of it that I think the general public doesn't think about because they, they don't make a lot of headlines. They're hugely important, but we don't talk. I mean, they're not hot button issues on talk radio. They're not firing up columnists like me to, to, to write about them, but they are really important. And, and it's easy to get pushed around on issues like that, maybe if you're if you're a newcomer, right? Which is why a lot of times, you know, you hear older lawmakers, they try to bring younger ones in, try to train them, not tell them necessarily how to vote, but try to like, like this is this is what we've done in the past. That's the institutional knowledge thing that people are talking about. And I guess it bothers me when people talk about that like it's an inherently bad thing. I mean, yes, if somebody's running like Tammany Hall down in Bismarck, and it becomes a political machine, then yes, I agree. That's a problem. But governing the state requires skill. I, how much of this, Mark, do you think we've gotten too cynical about politics? I sometimes think that because we all like to laugh about, you know, the, the weird things that happens and the tricks and the dirty tricks and everything, that we've become cynical about it. And we've started to think that public service and voting is kind of a joke. And then we start to think that just anybody can do it. And I just, I don't think that's right. I think it takes skill. I think it takes integrity. I think it, I think it takes experience just like anything else. It's, it's not an easy job. But do you think that's what's driving a lot of this where it's just kind of cynical attitudes about public service? Yeah. I, I think it is. And I, I think when we, um, you know, to relate, think about that board that you may serve on. And uh, when you're first elected, you get in the room and, and uh, you know, you kind of had this outlook when you came there, well, I'm gonna go do this or this because it's just obvious. And then you get in the room and you get to hear the rationales and the, the you know, the, the real reason why some things are done. And uh, all of a sudden you start to get a better understanding. Doesn't mean you can't make changes, but you understand why some things happen for the reason they happen. Now, the public themselves can be very cynical. And, and of course, we, we like to focus a little bit too much on single issues. And uh, then we forget about the talk and the dialogue about the other issues. It, many times, the single issues, you may have a Dem and a Republican that agree, but it's a single issue, so we tend to tie it to something. And uh, I, I, I really think it's disappointing people don't dig a little bit deeper beyond a, a, a single issue once in a while and, and ask the right questions on things they really care about. But you do need institutional knowledge. You need a, uh, you know, a perfect scenario is to have some new, have some uh, middle people that have been there and then have some historical folks that have been there. And then, of course, there always is a time when people do need to step out, let new in. But that's what the voters get to do in every election. So and, and the uh, opinion you really about, need to balance. And the opinion about when that time is is going to be personal, right? I mean, my feeling about somebody exactly. who's been there a long time might differ from yours. And that's OK. We're just two different people that, that maybe view the world a little bit differently. But it, it becomes a very personal thing. Give me some insight into how your group 
makes a decision. Because my understanding, when I've, I've seen, you know, sort of observed policy groups trying to arrive at positions on issues, it's a lot of, well, how does our membership feel about this? So you send out surveys or you you have a meeting or there's a committee. So how does it work for your group on this? Because earlier you said, you know, you're very grassroots centric, which t- frankly t- tends to be the case with a lot of these groups, uh, a lot of groups like yours, whatever the policy area. So give us some insight into how you arrived at this position. So it, it works really simple. In fact, we're right in the beginning of our season where we do our annual policy and action debate and uh, our county conventions really kick off here typically between the harvests uh, now this year we're harvesting all together but they'll come together either at a, what we call a local level or a county level and what they'll do is they'll they'll resolutions and they'll elect them and they'll vote on them on a local level they're sent into a committee not for a committee to disperse them or to say what they believe about it but they're to put them into a, our existing book and uh, once we have that book put together uh, we go to our convention and member can show up, a delegate can show up. Um, we'll have six, 700 people at our convention. And we go through basically by line about a hundred page book of policies. Now, it's really easy for me after that book is done because I know where I'm going to stand based on what that's in that book. Uh, there is times though when uh, we may have not have a policy on something because you can't have a policy on everything. Sure. We're, you know, we're our farm organization. Uh, so then we have a board of governors, which is county presidents, and we have a state board, and we come together and make a decision based on what we think the people that would represent want us to represent on an issue is not in the book. But on this one, it's right in the book. It's been voted on many times. The book is passed. Uh, the individual uh, cooperatives have input. Uh, counties have input. A member can come to our convention. So those who show up in our convention, those who come and write the book, they're the ones that decide what our organization represents. Yeah, I think sometimes, the, the, again, we, we throw around terms like lobbyists and everything else, and I, I, I get why we're cynical about some of that. But I think a lot of times we look at, at groups, whether it's the Farm, Farm Bureau or the Farmers Union or, or the NRA or, or the Chamber of Commerce or any of these groups, and you're forgetting that they represent people, right? At the end of the day, and maybe different groups are better at listening to their constituents than others, but you know, ultimately... Those groups have money because people give them money. People are members of those groups. People support those groups because they don't have the time to be at the legislature themselves tracking every bill and tracking every committee hearing and developing relationships with lawmakers and providing that input saying, hey, I'm a farmer, I'm a gun owner, I'm a business owner, whatever the issue area is, and this is this is how I, 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 this is how I feel about this policy. This is the mechanism through which people make their voices heard in Bismarck, because most of us don't have time to go testify, you know, at all the committee hearings. So sometimes I hear people denigrate this process and I'm thinking to myself, okay, but what about the groups you support, right? Whether it's a gun control group or a pro-gun group or, or whatever your issue is, right? There's groups that are supporting you that you're probably supporting. And I guess it's okay when you do it, but not anybody else. I, I, I think, again, that speaks to kind of the cynicism. And there's this, this disconnect between how politics actually works and how we perceive it as working. Does that make sense? It, it, it really does. And, and I think we've lost something in our education component of, you know, teaching people about uh, you know, how our government works, the importance of, you know, lobbyists get a bad name too, but in reality, lobbyists are a source of information. Now, obviously, there's there's really good lobbyists. There's some a little bit on the edge lobbyists. There's uh, some that uh, are career lobbyists. But at the end of the day, the, the, the legislative folks rely on them to bring them information. And then it's up to them to determine who's giving them the most important facts. It's uh, people that are really representing a grassroots organization. And, and once they once do that, then they become a reliable source. Our organization and the Farm Bureau does the same thing. We, we try very hard to build those relationships so that when we go and talk to them, we're telling them what our members think. And uh, if you do that, you get the respect of the legislator. Doesn't mean they agree, doesn't mean they always vote with us, but you get the respect that you're telling them something that's valuable. So the key is, is uh, having somebody represent you that can truly tell the story that represents you. So you need these groups. Um, I prefer the ones where they have a good membership base. I. I think it is it brings a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more of what the true numbers represent. But with that said, you you kind of need everything because no one knows everything about everything, and uh, you you really need to have these good debates. So at the end of the day, hopefully we come up with better solutions than we would without the debate. 
What do you think, and I, I don't know if you've seen any polling. I've seen polling, and I think the Term Limits Group has released polling that I, I don't think is probably that far off the mark, but it, it polls very popular. What's hard for me to discern is the difference between people and the general concept of term limits, which I think most North Dakotans kind of like, and this specific proposal for term limits, which is just eight years in any one legislative chamber and just eight years for the lawmaker for, for the governor. And by the way, the average of the lawmakers who are currently serving, the average time served is 10 years. The median time served is eight years. Only two governors in state history have served more than two term or more than eight years, I should say. Um, so I, I, I'm not looking. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to find where the problem is but what do you think the impact if north dakotans vote for this what's the impact on the legislature because what i'm afraid is we're going to lose some of what makes north dakota special we have a part-time legislature they are constitutionally restrained no more than 80 days every two years unless they're called into special session um they're very accessible i'm afraid we're going to lose some of that if we go to term limits because it's just, I, I, I'm i worried that we're going to end up with, with every year sessions or we're going to end up with full-time lawmakers. Because otherwise, I don't know how they do the job. That's what I'm afraid of. Like, I'm afraid if we put this in our Constitution, we're going to have to make some other changes to the legislature in order to govern effectively. That's what I'm afraid of long-term. And I'm not sure North Dakotans are thinking about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, term limits can create somewhat of an apathy and. Um, you may elect somebody that isn't doing their job that you need to remove sooner than the term limit would, and uh, you simply let them serve until they're up because that's easier than going out and in that. The, the flip side is what you described. Okay, so what if we have some uh, really strong, good candidates and they're doing a, a, the job that represents what the people of North Dakota want, and all of a sudden they're phased out? Uh, remember, I always refer to a regular board meeting. I mean. Uh, it, it takes a year or two in most instances to get your feet underneath you to understand the system. And uh, if you do that, you're really only becoming somewhat effective in your second term, maybe your third term. And if you do term limits, you could just be coming effective and really understanding it, getting a position of a leadership role, being on a committee chair or some of these things where you can help others coming in. Uh, we're going to lose that institutional knowledge. And uh, sometimes we're going to have people voting for somebody different, even though they may not want to because there's, there's the candidate can't run again. Um, that's taking away a right. So I, I agree with you mostly on this, that the fact is there's a system out there that if you don't want somebody in, you can vote against. There's a system out there that lets people stay in that everybody supports. You don't need a term limit because you have a term limit in the election process if the citizens participate. So I think the system's working. I think numbers tell it very well that it's changeover is happening. And in our in our state has, you know, directions we had. Do we sometimes we're substantially more conservative? Sometimes we lean back to more moderate. Uh, we haven't been on a, a what we would call such a liberal side as of late, but uh, you know, we shift and cycle will come. Sure. And and that's how the system works. Politics are cyclical. Not not it's a very slow cycle in North Dakota sometimes, yes. but they are cyclical. <laughs> yes. Um let me you made a really good point. It's sometimes it can take a while for a lawmaker to get their feet under them. Sometimes, let's let's switch that over to, to talking about an issue. Sometimes it can take multiple legislative cycles to get an issue addressed. And not because, not even necessarily because people are resisting. Sometimes you have to study it. Sometimes it's really complicated. Um, sometimes you don't want to go the whole hog on, the, you know, you want to do part of it, see how that works, and then maybe try a little more, depending on the issue. One thing that I'm thinking of is, the sort of debate between property owners, which in North Dakota is farmers, right? You get out in the countryside, that's all farmland, um, versus hunters, right? And we had a question about access where, you know, far there are farmers who don't necessarily like that they have to go and post their land every year. You know, to, to other, you know, they don't like this, this idea that there's a presumption of access to their land. Hunters obviously yeah. want access so they can go and hunt. Hugely controversial issue, right? With all sorts of penumbras and, 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 and things to consider. And we're still working on it, right? I mean, it's taken us multiple legislative sessions. I would say that that's probably, I, I feel like we've made some good progress, but I feel it's still a work in progress. We're still trying to figure out. But what if they're one of the key lawmakers at the center of that? who just understands the issue, who's been leading the charge on it, what if they get term limited out? And now all of a sudden, partway through this very complex problem, 
that lots and lots of people are passionate about it, one of the key players has to step aside. That, to me, is what term limits does, and that's that's frustrating. Like I, I feel like that hurts our ability to make good policy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and you you picked a really good one. The hunting issue has been an issue forever, and uh, landowner rights is an issue forever. And and I think it is uh, one of these things where even though it may have taken longer than most of us would have hoped, um, you know, we've ended up with a pretty good compromise bill. Sure. And uh, it's really helping and, and it's, it's solving different things. It's solving for the farmer. You don't have to necessarily go out there and, and post and figure out where to get the proper distance between signs and all this. And you're also giving the hunter an opportunity to find out who that landowner is so they can reach out if they want to hunt. And uh, I think I think it's a balance. And, and I, I mean, that's what we really should strive for is, is how we get the best balance. And uh, you're right. You, you need some time in that. It takes uh, legislators to learn the systems. It needs to hear out the different groups that want something. And, and once they examine all them points, hopefully make the best decision that's in the best interest of everyone. Can't always be that, way, but that's the effort. Do you, uh, is your group talking about this campaign specifically? Are you guys going to be spending any money on ads or any sort of a campaign to uh, to, to push back or, or make your argument on, on term limits? We, we're going to use our own internal system. We're uh, basically, we you know, we mail out a magazine to like 35,000 people. And obviously we're on social media. We have a lot to connect. So uh, we'll put it that way. Um, you know, we're doing conferences like this, press conferences with uh, different groups. I've been on this is probably my third show talking about it. So we're going to do it that way. Um, we're not going to make a campaign on it uh, where we're just going to spend money on, on it. Uh, that's uh, that's typically not our style, but uh, we're definitely letting people know that we're uh, not supporting this change. And uh, again, we'll be out in our county convention and stuff. The questions will come. Uh, we'll tell people where we're at. And, and of course, some of that will lead us down a path of talking about it more in public. Mark, I appreciate your time coming on today. It's a it's a complex issue, but again, uh, probably the most consequential issue on the ballot this cycle. This changes a fundamental change in the way we're governed. So again, I appreciate you coming on and talking about it. Thank you. I enjoy doing it. So anytime. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inform.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inform.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.